Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good to be back at Bronxville Community Church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David, and I'm grateful for the warm introduction. Uh, thank you for the, to the worship team, for uh, the wonderful songs and leading us in God's presence. It's good to be back. Uh, as Pastor Rich said, I reside in the Philadelphia area now with my wife, and unfortunately in the process, we've become diehard Philadelphia sports fans, so we took particular joy in the game last week when the G-Boys took a big loss, and we're excited for today. Um, but this church has uh, a special place in my heart four years ago. It's crazy to think. Four years ago, uh, I did a summer internship, and Pastor Rich gave me uh, the first opportunity in my life to preach on a Sunday morning, and I also got to make a lot of friends and memories from here, and uh, so it's just always a, a blessing to be back. So with that said, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18 this morning. So if you, have, if you have a Bible today, please open it up to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Here's God's word. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning where we get to gather as your people on your day and lift up our hearts in worship and hear your word preached. I pray, Lord, right now that by your spirit you would speak through me Give us ears to hear and eyes to see, and I pray, Lord, that you would find this pleasing in your sight. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. There are things that happen every year that no matter what catch me by surprise. Normally, around the end of August, I'll walk into a CVS and for whatever I need, and I'll see the Halloween decorations up and the candy and the pumpkin baskets and all that, and it always throws me off. And I know it's coming every year, but for some reason, it throws me off. And then Halloween happens, I go into CVS a few weeks later, and next thing you know, the Thanksgiving stuff is up. And then the second you have your last bite of turkey, all the Christmas decorations are up, and you just can't catch a break. And then January things slow down, but then the chocolates and the roses, and, and that one didn't bother me as much, but now I'm married. So uh, it means a lot more than it used to. But speaking of holidays and seasons, uh, in certain churches that hold to the church calendar, they found they just ended a season known as Epiphany, which is after the Christmas season, uh, churches take a few weeks to focus on what it means that Jesus was born, what it means that God came to the earth, the implications of the incarnation. And our text this morning starts right off after the central part of the book, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which is known as the poem or the hymn of Christ's incarnation. And in many ways, Philippians is functioning as a great text for Epiphany because it's meditating on the implications of how we need to live in light of God becoming man. This poem is uh, most likely a song that was sung in the church in Philippi. And so Paul is quoting it to them because he knows that they're going to understand it, that they probably sing it every Sunday. And we see also that, uh, as Pastor Rich preached on how, in Philippians there were some personality issues. Paul is sent to prison, and he says as he's in prison that he rejoices regardless of the intentions of people preaching. He's happy at least the gospel is being preached. And that goes to tell you there's some issues going on. There's some people with the wrong intentions and leadership there's drama going on, and there's problems 
not only with persecution outside, because Paul's in prison, but also within the congregation. Yet Paul does not just give moral advice and things to do, uh, just random things to do, but he tells them here to meditate on Jesus. And we see that in verses 5 through 11. This beautiful poem, he, he tells them to focus on the suffering of Christ and his humiliation. And it's in light of Christ's humiliation and exaltation that he calls them to obey him, to strive for unity, and to be of one mind. And so with all that said, let's look here at verse 12. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. So there's two key things to look at in this one verse, two key words. The first word is therefore. Whenever Paul uses the word therefore, think of big lights flashing because he's saying he's building an argument here. So therefore, he's saying in light of what I'm just about to tell you, you need to understand what I just said. They're very connected. And so he's giving this flashlight that we need to look back a little bit at verses 5 through 11 to understand what he's about to say. So the call for the church of Philippi is to be of the same mind and the same love and to submit to one another. And we have to see what he said now in verse 5 through 11 and, and why that's important. But the second thing we need to look at is what he says in verse 12 is this. He says this, Now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So he says now. So he's saying now you need to obey me much more in my absence. Paul's in prison now. And so the church in Philippi has to adjust to that. And he's saying, you need to obey me in a different way. Not because I'm here, but you have to obey me now because I'm not here. And you have to obey Jesus even if I'm not here. So now, much more in my absence, you need to focus on these things and hold on to them. Paul's in prison. And the church in Philippi is a dear one to him. It's the first church he planted in Macedonia. And so the congregants, they've known Paul They've been shepherded by Paul. And the only life that the church in Philippi really knows is a life with Paul in the picture. And now he's writing to them in prison. He's not there. They have to make adjustments. The Philippian church is reminiscing about Paul, wishing that things were the way they used to be. It was easier for them to obey and be united when Paul was around. I think for all of us, if there was an apostle in the room, it would be a lot easier Though Paul desires to return, the reality is, is that the Philippian church was in some ways spoiled by having the presence of an apostle, and now they need to transition to a life without him. They had elders in their church, and Paul later says that he's going to send his bishop Timothy to check in on them, but in the meantime, and now in light of his absence, they need to work out their salvation in fear and trembling. Paul is telling them to focus on the one who called him. Paul is directing them to set their hearts on the one who Paul encountered on the Damascus Road when he encountered Jesus and was blinded. And Jesus said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? The one who turned Paul from a persecutor to a great planter of churches. The call for the Philippians now is to submit to one another and to put each other above themselves. And it's rooted in the person of Jesus and the scandal of him coming down to us and becoming man. He says this in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, the mind to be submissive to one another, to obey one another. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So in light of God becoming a servant, I need you to obey him. I need you to obey me. In light of God coming down, you need to obey me. For those that belong to other religions like Judaism or Islam, these words I just read in verse 5 are scandalous, crazy, offensive, blasphemous. The idea that God would become a person for them is one of the biggest scandals about Christianity. It's why they refuse to accept Christianity because in their minds they think God is way too powerful to ever humble himself to the point of death, to ever become a human. They find it impossible that God would do such a thing and become a servant, because for them that's something God would not do. They think God becoming a person would 
take away from his glory, take away from his divinity. But we see in the Bible, from the very beginning, God was preparing to dwell among us. That verse that Pastor Rich referenced, John 1.1, 1, 1, that John, in chapter 1, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is not something that catches us by surprise, because we see all throughout the Old Testament that God was coming towards us in that way. From the very beginning, what happens when Adam and Eve fall? Paul, uh, God tells the serpent to Adam and Eve that from her seed there will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. From the very beginning, the moment they fall, there's a promise that from Eve's line, someone is going to come and destroy death, destroy sin, and destroy the serpent. Then we see later with Abraham, God says, from your seed, all the nations will be blessed. That from the very beginning, we see the promise continue that from Abraham's line, there's going to be one person whom the whole world will be blessed. Then we see with David, he, the prophet Samuel, speaking on God's behalf, tells David that when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be a father, and he shall be to me a son. So we see, even with David, there's this promise of the one who is going to be the king of kings, who will establish his eternal throne and kingdom. And just one more example, we see with the prophet Isaiah, that he speaks of the one who will be pierced and crushed for our iniquities, the suffering servant. And these are just a handful of examples that display how all throughout the Old Testament there is this promise coming, there's this expectation coming that someone born from Bethlehem will come. And so it's not a scandal for us what we see in verses 5 through 11 that God humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, because that was the expectation that someone would come, a Messiah would come, all the way from Genesis to the, to the very end of the Old Testament, we see these glimpses, these small pictures of God's humility. He did not show himself distant or a heartless God who is not accessible, but he chose Israel. He dwelt in the tabernacle and told us that through his prophets that there would be the prophet, the priest, and the king who would conquer death through his suffering. And so the crucifixion and the humiliation that we see in verses 5 through 11 is a scandal, but it's not a scandal because it catches us by surprise. It's a scandal for other religions that don't believe that Jesus was God because it catches them by surprise. But for us, it's a scandal because we don't deserve it. God becoming man is a scandal for us because not because we didn't see it coming, but because it's something that we don't deserve. It's a scandal because God coming to us shows how awful the state of our sin was. It's a scandal because it shows that the only way for us to be saved was the eternal God to come down and humble himself to the humiliating, excruciating death on a Roman cross. It's scandalous because there is no other way for the world to be saved. But at the same time, it demonstrates the scandalousness of God's love for us that in the scandal of God coming to us in the person of Jesus, we see the scandal of his love, his deep love for his people, how far he would be willing to go to save his people from their sins. You see, the God of Muslims and other religious groups, they may say that their God is powerful, but what we see is he is not powerful enough to love humans. He's not powerful enough to love you. But we see the power of of God coming and dwelling among us and suffering. God identified with our human state. He got his hands dirty. And as theologians put it, he went, one theologian put it, he went into the far country. He left his throne and came to us. But he did it as God. He did it as fully God and fully man, identifying with us in his humiliation and crucifixion. And through that, saving and redeeming us in his resurrection. And we read in that end of that poem that every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord because of his suffering, because of what the entire poem says. 
because he is the suffering and humble servant, through that, he defeats and conquers death. And so, what Paul is trying to get at is, you, the, one who, the reason you obey each other, the reason you submit to each other, is because of what God has done. Because he's the one that humbled himself. You need to be humble because he was humble. You need to put others first because he put others first. And the beauty of this poem is that, as it says, on the last day, every knee will bow before him. In his radiant and his bright glory, the craziest thing is, is that when you stand before him, when you stand before Jesus, you'll see those, those scars in his hand. They're still going to be there. You'll be always reminded when you see him in glory one day that the road to Jesus being on the throne was a road that was through the cross. You'll always have that scar in his side and those piercings in his hand, even as the Lord of Lords. And that's what Paul is trying to get at here. That we, he's exalted, but the way he got there was through humiliation and through suffering. And so that's how he's such an example to us. And it's at this point that Paul tells us at the, first, at the end of verse 12 to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. When we really pause to consider the work of Christ, to consider what he went through, that the immortal, all-powerful, triune God sent his eternal son to suffer for our sake, and that all of that was because of our sin, is a very sobering thought. When Moses was at Mount Sinai, if you remember the story of Moses, Moses says, God, show me your glory. And what does God tell him? He says, okay, but you can only see my back, and even if you see my back, I have to hide you in the mountain, because that's how terrifying and awestruck you'll be from seeing my glory. Now that same glory became human and enwrapped himself in flesh. And that same glory who became human is now seated in heaven. And he's so powerful and mighty that even the angels struggle to behold him. Even the angels right now struggle to even look at him because of how glorious and beautiful he is. And what Paul's trying to say is, he mentions several times the day of the Lord, that we too one day are going to stand before him. That we too one day are going to be with the angels and the archangels and will see him as he truly is. And as much as I'm looking forward to that, I'm also a little nervous. I don't know about you. Because that glory that Moses saw, but could barely see, won't be veiled anymore. It will be in the fullness of its radiance and you'll stand before him. And what Moses had to hide in the cleft of mount, the mountain to, to look at the back of, we will see fully, face to face. The writer of Revelation talks about Jesus' eyes being like a flame of fire and his, his voice being like the sound of, of um, roaring waters to just illustrate the, the, what's going on in heaven right now, what we are going to be coming to. Imagine getting a call tomorrow or after this that you have to go, the White House calls you and says, hey, we're sending a chopper. You need to come see the president right now. Now, regardless of your thoughts of the president, I, I think you'd be nervous if you had to stand in the Oval Office. And maybe you're uh, more confident than I am and you wouldn't be nervous. Or think, in that, in, if that's the case, think of maybe the first time that you had to perform a recital or a uh, a dance, whatever it may be, the first time that you ever have to perform in public, you would be nervous, right? It's appropriate to be nervous for the first time you perform. It's appropriate to be nervous the first time you stand before the board at your job and give a presentation. It, these, it's appropriate sometimes to be nervous. It's appropriate sometimes to be in fear and trembling. And that's what we have to carry in our minds when we see when Paul tells them, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. This is not a, a threat in this text, but rather it's pointing to how glorious God is. Because he's saying, therefore, in light of Jesus being exalted, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. In light of the fact that every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord, right now, here on earth, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's not a work it out because you're not sure what's going to happen to you. It's, no, now that I just told you who Jesus is, the appropriate response is 
is to at some points when you really think about you'll stand before him, you know, your, your knees might buckle a little bit. But it's because you're saved. It's because you're justified. It's because you're in him that you know you'll stand before him. And that's what this whole life is about. It's a preparation for that final day where we stand before him. And at some points in that road to preparation, it's appropriate to have some fear and trembling. Because that glory that was hidden, you will see fully. And perhaps when you read that text, that work out your salvation in fear and trembling, it might make you uneasy. It might, you might think it shouldn't be there. Why do I need to work out my salvation in fear and trembling? Jesus loves me. But perhaps the reason this text can be troubling for us at times is because maybe we don't even realize it. Sometimes we commodify God. We make God in Jesus the lovey-dovey Jesus that kind of looks like a Obi-Wan Kenobi that hangs in some people's houses. A Jesus that is easy to grasp and easy to hold. A Jesus who, when we first think of him, is more like a teddy bear than one we should bow before. I'm grateful for shows like The Chosen, but I just want to say we have to remember when we're watching shows like that that it's depicting Jesus in his humiliation. It's Jesus before the cross, not Jesus after the cross. And we have to keep that balance as we're watching these kind of things, as we're thinking about Jesus, because the Jesus after the cross on the throne right now is very different than the Jesus before the cross, because the glory in his earthly ministry was hidden. And you might question what I say, but look at the transfiguration. If you remember that moment where, where Paul, uh, Jesus tells John and Peter to come with him. And there's this moment, right, where the glory, Jesus in his fully glorified state comes out. And what is, Paul, what is uh, Peter and John's reaction? Do you remember? They were horrified. They fell on the floor and tried to run away because the second Jesus, even a glimpse of the glory he had was revealed, they were terrified because they weren't prepared for it because it was something that Moses saw in the cleft of that mountain. And that was just a glimpse of what Jesus will be like in heaven. And the apostles themselves couldn't even stand before it and fell on their faces. And it's just important to keep this in mind as we meditate on Jesus, that he's both the Jesus who lived on the earth and he's now the Jesus that rose up in triumph. And we have to hold the balance because he is the God who came to us. He is the God that dwelt among us. He is the God who loves us and and we can look at his earthly ministry and be encouraged by that. But at the same time, he's the Jesus whom every knee will bow before. We have to keep those things together. And, we have, and so when we recognize this, that we really appreciate Jesus for all that he is. And that's what Paul is calling us to remember. That is what he calls us to remember and the church in Philippi. He wants them to know that their obedience, their unity, their call to love and serve one another is rooted not in his apostolic authority, but it's rooted in who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And that's the beauty of the Christian message. Because he doesn't tell them, as I said, obey one another, love one another, submit to one another, and then go read a book that has nothing to do with, do with that. Go follow some rules, go read a blog, but he says this. Rather, he says, do these things and look upon Jesus. Do these things and look at the one who's our example. That Jesus is not only our redeemer, but he's also our example. That the one who saved us is also the one we're supposed to look to in, in, in how we transform our lives. Christ did not save us and tell us to look elsewhere. And that's the beauty of this text, that, that the therefore obey is rooted in looking upon Jesus. That there's no command that Paul gives that isn't saying at the same time, look upon him. And that's what holiness means. It's looking to Christ, being changed by Christ, being renewed into his image. And we become one minds as our minds are fixed on him. That's what he's telling the church of Philippi. Now that I'm gone, you guys want to be united, you want to submit to one another, you want to persevere through this time of persecution, all together look upon him. Look upon his example. 
As the church in Philippi was missing Paul, wishing for the old days, Paul reminds them that what is going to keep them going is not him, but their commitment to Christ. He mentions in verse 15 that they're in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. The pagans in Philippi's day were watching how the church was behaving. Paul got imprisoned, and it says the whole imperial guard knew about it. The whole town realized that Paul was in prison, and people were interested in this small little church. They were surrounded by unbelievers who had a vested interest in seeing them fall, to see the church get caught up in inner turmoil. And they wanted to see, are these people that go to this church anything like that guy who's in prison? Do they believe the same things that he believes? And Paul tells them that the way they witness the pain and power of Christ is by how they act. It's by how they submit to one another, how they love one another, how they do those things together. Because when they submit to one another, they're pointing to Christ's submission to the will of the Father. When they are united, they're pointing to the world about, of the unity between the Father and the Son. When they love one another, the world will know Jesus by the love of the church. That's what Jesus says in John 17. And I hope that's encouraging for us here this morning. In a similar way, the church in Philippi was going through a time of transition. And passing the, chor- chur- the, the torch is something that's difficult. And the church of Philippi was experiencing that. And the church in Philippi was told to seek Christ, to look upon Christ. The church who hum- the Christ who humbled himself and took the form of a servant. And there's three ways that looking on Christ, as Paul tells them to do, benefits us. Well, three types of people it benefits. It benefits us, it benefits those around us in the church, and it benefits the watching world. Nothing bad can ever come from fixing your hearts on Jesus. Although when we look at Jesus, it can be painful, because the more we do it, the more we see how we're not like him, there is beauty in the pain, because in it, you become more like him. And as you become more like him, you're better able to love one another. And so fixing your hearts on Jesus not only helps you, but it helps the person sitting next to you. It helps your fellow church member as well. Because that's how you all become of one mind. It's as you set your heart on him that you start to see the needs of those around you. Because Jesus is not only your Savior and your God, but the Savior and God of the person next to you, the Savior and God of the person sitting, the other person in this community. And thirdly, he's not only your God, your fellow church's God, but he's the whole community's God, the watching world's God. He's not only there, he's not only your God, but theirs. And as you suffer and as you go through difficult times, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it in a way where the surrounding world, like the surrounding world in Philippi, is like, wow, they're worshiping the true Lord of Lords and King of Kings. For example, maybe you have a disagreement and someone in the, you, you tell a friend at ch- who doesn't go to church, you have a disagreement with someone at church, and they say, wow, but the way that you're handling your disagreement is so much different than how I would handle my disagreement. Oh, there's some drama going on. But look at how you guys handle it with so much grace. Oh, you, you're putting the needs of someone else above yourself. Wow. What makes you guys different as a community? And that's the power of imitating the humble servant Jesus. And that's what he's trying to tell them. As you become conformed to his image, the watching world will be at least blown away and want to at least entertain who this person is that you're worshiping. And so even though they have these troubles, the call for them is to focus on the power of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, to keep it at the forefront, to keep it at the forefront. And that's the power of the one whom before every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And he is the one who they're called to look to. And that's where that, that fear and trembling comes from, not from a place of 
of a fear of not knowing whether he loves you, but because he loves you, because he did what he did, you know you'll see him one day face to face. And so as we close, remember that the God whom we worship is so powerful that he came down to us, that he sent his son to redeem us from our sin by humiliating himself to the point of death, even on a cross. But not only did he destroy death by death, but he rose again and showed all the world's powers and principalities that Jesus is Lord. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, when he humbled himself to the point of death, I'm sure that the demons probably took joy in that. When they saw him beaten, stricken, and afflicted. I'm sure that the devil and his angels were having parties as the nails were being clobbered into his hands. But what they didn't realize is that it was through that that God was going to be highly exalted. And the very thing that the watching world mocked and ridiculed is the very reason they will stand before him one day and bow in fear and trembling. He is seated and he is enthroned through the road of suffering and we are now called to suffer with him so that we will one day stand before him and hear from that powerful, glorious God of ours, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. I'll pray as the worship team comes up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the example that you've set before us in your Son, that he empathizes with us, that he walked among us, and he conquered and did what we could not do. I pray, Lord, for those of us here that through your Spirit you would show us in our hearts where we can submit and love one another better. And wherever in our hearts we are caught up in legalism, I pray that we would look upon Jesus and remind ourselves that our transformation comes upon looking upon the one who transforms us. So I ask that you be among us for the rest of our time here this morning. Bless us this week. It's your name that we pray. Amen.